I could get your attention, if you would please grab a uh, beverage of your choice, maybe some um, appetizers, and then take your seat. We're going to start the official part of the program right now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 
so nice to see you all here today. I'm Cristela Musa, Dean of the College of Education, and it's uh, really a great honor for me to be able to share a few words uh, in honor of our colleague, uh, Stafford Hood. When um, I arrived here in the college uh, in about a year ago, Stafford, although retired, he made it a point to stop by one of the college's events um, to really formally welcome me to campus and reassure me that he was standing by to offer any support that I needed. Um, as you may know, Stafford was a graduate of the College of Education at Illinois. He received his PhD in 1984 with an emphasis in uh, program evaluation, administration, and policy analysis. He met his wife, Denise, here in the college, and this is why um, both the college and the university was um, always a special place for him, and this is why we're hosting this event here today. Uh, Stafford began his academic career as assistant professor of psychology and education at Northern Illinois University and soon after moved to Arizona State where he remained until 2008. In 2008, uh, University of Illinois was really fortunate to um, have him uh, return back as Sheila Miller Professor and Department Head in Curriculum and Instruction and Professor of Educational Psychology. He subsequently served as Associate Dean of Research in the College of Education, and in 2011, he became the founding director of the newly established Center for Cultural Responsive Evaluation and Assessment, a position he retained until his passing. Uh, CREA was a culmination of years of work moving evaluation towards more equitable-oriented practices responsive to cultural context. Stafford's evaluation record, as you all know, um, was uh, very rich. Uh, while in Arizona, he served on several NSF projects, including one with Navajo Nation, and one led by the American Indian Higher Education Consortium to develop an indigenous evaluation framework. Explaining the body of work, Stafford noted in one of the college's online materials, Central to doing evaluation work in indigenous communities are the traditions and values of those communities and their practice. The importance of culture and cultural context is at the core of the evaluation and assessment work that we do. The initial focus with indigenous populations in the United States really expanded nationally and internationally. Logally, Stafford collaborated with the principal of Booger Washington STEM Academy in Champaign to set up an evaluation lab for his graduate evaluation courses and provided advice on cultural responsive evaluation. His advanced doctoral students have worked on field assignments in the classroom developing cultural responsive evaluation plans with teachers in schools. Under his leadership, as you know, CREA successfully convened six conferences between 2013 and 2021. Last week, we completed the seventh one, and that was the first one since Stafford's passing, but the largest in terms of participation and attendance with attendees from all over the world. It is in the context of planning that conference that I had the privilege of speaking extensively with him right before his passing. We discussed a vision for elevating CREA and the University of Illinois campus, for building partnerships, and for leveraging resources to scale up that important work. I'm glad to share that Stafford's vision for CREA is moving forward. Nonetheless, I'm saddened, of course, that I have not had more time to work with him and learn from his experience and wisdom. The College of Education is committed to carrying uh, Stafford's memory with us. We will honor his legacy by continuing to build on the foundation of his work and his passion for utilizing cultural responsive evaluation to advance equitable policies for marginalized groups. In an article we published in 2019 on our uh, college's material, Stafford said, the educational and social needs of the marginalized are not going away. We continue to see ourselves as a work in progress. This is a journey for the work that we do in trying to make a difference, to make a contribution to improve their circumstances. We see ourselves as being social responsible in doing this work based on the skills that we have. So I continue to do that. It's a work in progress, a lifelong journey. On behalf of the College of Education at Illinois, you are committed to continuing Stafford's journey. Thank you for being here. Uh, 
I want to join uh, Dean Musa and my own appreciation of all the contribution that Stafford Hood made to the College of Education and what he's made globally, especially with CREA. I was at the CREA conference in Chicago, so was the dean. And we could see the legacy is firmly established. Uh, it's growing um, and it's having an impact internationally in different places and that will continue to multiply. And it's an idea whose time has come. Um, and I do recall when he was working on this at Arizona State, um, he had asked me to, I wasn't sure whether he was telling me the truth. <laughs> he's, he's been known to. <laughs> so he, he called me up, he says, I really need you to come down and give a keynote. Uh, well, why would I come down to Arizona State to give a keynote? He said, well, the keynote that I had has, has backed out on me. Only Denise would know if that actually happened. <laughs> I never asked her. I was like, I'm saying, did he really back out? Because now I'm feeling bad for him that the keynote would back out that close. So I said, okay. So I went down. He had this conference on race. And that was the beginning of career, where he had those conferences at Arizona State. Um, and I didn't quite know where it was going, but by the time he got here, uh, I could see where he was headed with it and was confident that it would have the kind of impact that it's having. At any rate, all of us who are close to Stafford have known him for over uh, decades, have been saying the same thing. How do we do in five minutes a friendship that's lasted so long? And one, to appreciate all of his contributions. And there are a couple of things that come to mind that remind me, in fact, I can't go a day without thinking about Stafford Hood because of these couple of things. One, you didn't just get to know Stafford Hood. If you knew Stafford Hood, you got to know his family. Shortly after I had met him, I was at his home in Chicago with his mother and his father having a meal. Next, you were getting to know his, his friends from childhood, his little league baseball friends, um, and friends everywhere, family and friends, and so, you knew him, and he was constantly introducing you to other people that were important to him. It was the kind of person that he was. If you knew him, then you would know people who really mattered to him, really important in his life. A uh, couple of speakers will follow me. The Leo High School classmates, and I was at a football game, and he said, well, you got to go with me. He's always, you got to go with me, and I'm always saying, why? <laughs> Because I don't know what's on the other end. Why? He says, you got to meet my guys from Leo. It's something that was very important to him, by the way. It mattered a great deal. He was very proud of that background. So I went over and met him at the tailgate. And in the next football game, he says, uh, you got to go with me. I said, not if you're going to that tailgate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I've had, I've had enough. <laughs> but anyway... I got to meet them for the first time, and um, and he spent hours on the end telling me about their experiences together at Leo High School. Um, and so, I, of all the friends that he had, became in so many ways friends of mine, and I talked to them all the time, and so good memories, fond memories that I continue to celebrate the ways in which he enriched my life uh, by introducing me to so many of his friends. Yeah. The other thing, and if you were around him for a short time, you heard him say, oh, you gotta go with me to my spot. <laughs> First time I heard it was like, my spot? What, what, what spot is this? 
So we were actually going to Chicago. I was driving. We were going to a conference. He said, you got to stop over here at my spot. I stopped, and he said, right here, they got the best corned beef sandwiches in the world. And he had a spot for everything. <laughs> you know, one day I asked him, just how many spots do you have? <laughs> some were fun, and some were dangerous. <laughs> and one time, we happened to be in Las Vegas together. And I had settled in, and I was comfortable where I was. And he's like, you got to go with me. You got to go to my spot. I'm like, where is your spot? And I had to go trekking across Las Vegas to Ballas. Get to Ballas, he says, they got the best turkey burgers in the world. <laughs> it was always the best something. And he never ran out of spots. I wasn't with... Um, Brother Mickey Johnson, when he took him to his margarita place, that was his favorite spot, and ordered what was called white death drink. I was like, I'm glad you told me. So <laughs> when he's in my spot in Arizona, I'll, create, I'll think of something to say that I'm busy. But he had so many spots and so many friends, and if you knew him, you became a part of all of that. And it's just enriched your life in so many ways. And I always felt that, uh, and he seemed to think that it was his mission. He was adventurous, no doubt about it. He'd go places and think nothing of it. You know, fly off to Dublin, fly off to Hawaii, go places. And he thought it was his mission in life for me to have some adventure. I guess he saw me <laughs> as dull and no place to go with nothing to do. So it's like, he did persuade me to go on a cruise with him one time. <laughs> that was it. And he tried to say, you got to go to Dublin. I got a lot of spots in Dublin, and I know <laughs> Joe O'Hara. And I was like, there's no way I'm flying to Dublin with you. Yeah, I can, and, and I, I escaped that one. But so many of them I did, I did not escape. But he thought, man, if I can just get you to branch out and be more adventurous. Uh, and he tried. He tried his best. It's, you know, If we fell short, it, it wasn't from him, for him not trying. It was for me saying, no, I'm not flying to this place or that place. And I, I'll always look at him like, you don't think anything of it. You just get on a plane and fly to Dublin. And he had a career. As you know, we have a career affiliation in Dublin at the University of Dublin, and he would go there and hook up with his friends, and I would think, man, that's, that's, a, that's a tough call to fly all the way to Dublin. And he never stopped trying, and I never stopped saying no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, um, when I first met him, I had no clue that our relationship would evolve in a way that it did. Um, I did pick up on one of the things that accounts for much of his contributions, uh, scholarly and, and, and otherwise, when I was his uh, advisor and thesis director, is that he would work so hard and he was so passionate about his subjects and you knew he wouldn't stop until he saw them, saw the fruits of what he was studying. And so when he started in on Korea, I knew once again that he wouldn't stop until it, it that he had realized um, its highest potential. And it did, and we all proud. Uh, it's a signature event for the College of Education, um, and it's having an impact in so many places. I am certainly proud and appreciative of his work um, and his contributions. Um, and as much as I try not to think about him, I ended up thinking about all those spots that he seemed to have. 
And the other thing is, is that he would call me before every fight in the line I basketball game and before every fight in the line I football game and before every Chicago Bulls game and Chicago Bears. And we'd have to have a conversation. Then he'd call back again at halftime. And at the end, he would call again. And these were different conversations. It was like, one, you think we have a chance? A little upbeat. By the time he got to the end, he was like, I can't believe that that's sorry. <laughs> and he did it. It was just a ritual. And so another reason I ended up remembering so much about those days is that he has friends now that do the same thing. They will call me and say, I know you're waiting on a call from Stafford, but um, just want to call you and talk to you about not football or basketball or whatever. And these conversations, um, and I was over his house so much for so many meals, every Thanksgiving and so forth, and just enjoyed his company. Um, you couldn't have a better friend. Um, and um, I am truly appreciative of having known him um, and of his contributions. I was really pleased when he decided to leave Arizona State and come back to the College of Education. I knew that would be a plus for us, and it turned out to be a huge plus uh, for our college. We will continue to build on the legacy that he's left. Um, and we have people in the college who, who understand Korea, who are affiliated with Korea, and know how to take Korea to the next level. So um, I'm appreciative of that. Um, and I guess I will close as I hand it off to his high school classmates that he was so proud of his little league I was like, why are you telling me about your Little League baseball team? Well, <laughs> he, had introduced, you know, he had introduced, to me, introduced me to them as accomplished professionals. They had grown up. But he, he was the kind of person that took a great deal of proud, pride in his origins, where he went, where he lived, his Little League team, where he went to high school, Leo. His, and he wanted you to meet all of them because to him they were important people. Uh, and people that you just just would enrich your life. And so um, my knowledge of different people, different persons, just expanded uh, because of Stafford Hood. Um, and um, he never stopped trying to take me to the next adventure there. And I'm, I'm more appreciative now than, than then. He never got the fact that I was the exact opposite. As much as he liked to fly to Dublin, I disliked it. <laughs> as much as he liked to go internationally, different places, as much as he liked to go on a cruise, I was as deathly afraid of going. I'd never been on the water before. And wasn't going, Denise finally convinced me that it would be okay. Um, but I was like, no, there's no way I'm getting caught out on the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm thankful for having to meet and get to know all of his friends. Um, they have really made my life better. Um, and many of them are here today. Um, and we had this cohort in graduate school. His graduate colleagues are here today as well. Uh, that was interesting and exciting. Um, but <clears throat> We just miss him, that's all. And we know, even this occasion, how much more exciting it would be if he was here. So my thanks to him, my thanks to all of his friends, and uh, from different parts, different places. And, and now for his classmates from, I think it's Warren next? No. I think his classmates from Leo, yeah.
afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Bob Standring and John Gilmartin. And uh, where'd Jim go? Jim, get up here. <laughs> Can't let you escape here now. Denise was kind enough to ask me to say a couple words on Stafford's behalf. We are uh, classmates and, and a couple of teammates from Stafford's High School, Leo High School in Chicago. And uh, if, if any of you are familiar with it, it's a um, Catholic high school uh, taught originally from uh, Christian Brothers of Ireland. Started way back in uh, 1926, so we're almost coming up on our 100th year. But um, uh, we were fortunate enough to have Stafford be a big part of our lives back then. And we, we just wanted to share uh, a couple little uh, items. And so what I did is rather than take this few minutes of just talking by myself, <clears throat> I thought it'd be more beneficial to Denise and her family and the crowd that uh, maybe we canvass some of the people from our class and uh, give you a little opinion of what they thought about Stafford. So um, uh, we all said a little something here that we'll repeat to you in a second. But uh, uh, I think Jim had, uh, Jim Hogan, he, he had, because uh, his name is uh, right next to Stafford Hogan and Hood. And so he would sit, yeah, he'd sit right in front of Stafford in all these classes. That's how they used to do it. They used to set them up by alphabetical order. So. Um, Jim, why don't you just read a little bit about what you said here? <laughs> All right. Need the mic? Yeah, here's the mic. So, yeah, like Bob said, Leo almost here, here's, always here's seated our mic, class. Jim. Okay. Yeah. Leo almost uh, seated our classes in alphabetical order. Stafford sat right behind me in many classes throughout our years. Hogan, then Hood. I still remembered Stafford's big round smile as I would slide into my desk in front of him. He was so smart and was always well prepared. I often lamented that I was not sitting behind him to peruse his answers. <laughs> I'm certain the smile and the wonderful personality is, wish, wish, is missed by many. Thank you very much. He was a great guy. Um, okay. We're, so, yeah, we'll, 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 okay. I'm going to just rotate him. Again, we've got five minutes up here, so I promise I'll not exceed that, but I just want to give you a little flavor for what some of these people uh, talked about them. So um, uh, you want to do, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, do John, do, yeah, do, do uh, Dan uh, McGrath, this is the president of Leo High School. This is what he had to say about Stafford. Yeah, this is the current president, Dan McGrath of Leo High School, uh, was a great sports writer for the Chicago Tribune. He, he wrote this about Stafford. He said, Dr. Stafford Hood was the embodiment of a Leo man. He was a Leo student while Leo occasionally painful transition from a white majority to white minority student body was taking place. But his character, his integrity, his values, they were so obvious that they distinguished Stafford as someone we could all look up to, so he helped ease the transition. It was probably his first experience as a role model. He excelled at it, and he performed it throughout his life. When he had walked in their shoes, he was smart, he was sensible, he was open and approachable, and he went on to achieve great things. He was the embodiment of a role model for Leo students. We mourn his passing, but we celebrate Stafford Hood as the embodiment of a Leo man. Uh, I wrote a little something here. Uh, Stafford was a great teammate, great person, good friend, always pleasant. Uh, never saw him angry or upset with anybody. Uh, the Leo model of our school was facta non verba. Latin for deeds, not words. Well, in my opinion, Stafford lived up to the embodiment of that 1,000% and then some. So definitely the school model, definitely uh, he ran with it for sure. Then we had uh, another teammate, Rich Marks. Uh, I could not think of a better man 
whom we could celebrate than Stafford. My greatest memory of him is how he treated people. Back in our day, there was quite a bit of black and white clash. Stafford did not see color. He was first a black kid that I really got to know, a great teammate, great friend, a true Leo man. Facta non verba, deeds not word, show what kind of man you are, a man who really lives his deeds. Rich was uh, uh, one of the uh, former football players with us, and he, he ended up playing uh, for Northern, and then he also played in, uh, in the uh, pro football, the USFL. So he had a nice little career going. But um, there's a couple other uh, ones that um, uh, I just wanted to bring, bring about was um, James, Jimmy Daniels. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard, if any of you know anything about the track and field area, but James Daniels, back when we were at Leo High School, he was in Sports Illustrated for getting the, the, uh, the, the national record for the 60-yard dash. And uh, he was a, um, a great, he played football with us at Leo, and then he also ran track. And then he went on and played a, at, a, at a college up in Minnesota. But he had um, some very nice words to say about uh, Stafford in that uh, <clears throat> I would like to, prof uh, to express my profound admiration for Stafford, <clears throat> whom I had the pleasure of knowing both as a remarkable teammate and outstanding classmate. As the years passed, we maintained our connection through exchanging thoughtful messages over email and text. Even after he accepted a teaching position at the esteemed University of Illinois, our conversations revolved around a range of topics, including potential paths that my daughter, the now accomplished Dr. Jasmine Daniels, could pursue after completing her clinical psychology internship an area of interest that he shared. Although, <clears throat> although we endeavored, uh, I'm sorry, in, in order that we had never connected uh, to coordinate face-to-face -face meetings at some point because of our hectic schedules, timetables unfortunately preceded us from doing so, even on the occasion of our, our 50th class reunion. Uh, regrettably, I will always lament that we are unable to meet in person before his tragic passing. Let us, uh, let us pray that his soul may rest in peace. Uh, sincerely, Jimmy Daniels. Um, uh, there's a, um, another one here, Jim. Why don't you take, uh, one here? take Eddie. You know Eddie. Eddie, Eddie, yeah. Eddie was a, uh, turns out to be a, um, uh, the Cat Run ran Chicago Board of Options Exchange. Yeah, Ed was, uh, yeah, CEO, yeah, he was uh, CEO of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. I ended up going to the Chicago Board of Education as a teacher. He went to the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, okay, uh, w which worked out better. But, but again, uh, did fine. I, I, and, and I think following Stafford, I know, um, I, I taught in some difficult situations in Chicago on the south side, and I know I saved some boys. I know I did. So, uh, you know, the, the path that, that he followed was terrific, and uh, I had a short journey in that myself. But anyways, we had this one crazy guy, Ed Joyce, that, uh, you know, again, you know, crazy but still, uh, uh, you know, so, so successful. And so his, his, here's his Ed's words about Stafford. Stafford and I were in quite a few classes at Leo. A few years ago, we worked together in planning the reunion of the uh, 50th uh, class reunion of Leo High School. We had fun swapping stories as we reached out to our classmates. On, on, one, uh, on every phone call, we would find ourselves laughing as we shared memories. I was blessed to have known Stafford and was fortunate to have had the opportunity to get reacquainted. Until we meet again, God bless Staffordhood. Ed Joyce. Um, we've got a couple of... Um grammar school friends that Stafford went to grammar school with. St. Leo, right? Yeah, St. Leo Grammar School. <coughs> and uh, Street. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, Dave Mutter, I don't know if that name would ring a bell to you, or, or Bill Murphy. And um, uh, 
Dave is, is a comment here from, uh, from the time at Leo Grammar School to Leo High School, Stafford exhibited bright, intelligent, and a zeal for life and knowledge. He was a solid person who knew what he wanted in life and pursued it. I'm sure he's greatly, I'm sure you'd be greatly missed by his family and close friends and associates. Um, RIP, you did good. That's from Dave Mutter. Um, you wanna take uh, Bill Murphy's? Sure. He's, uh, he's the other classmate, the second to last page. Okay, I got Bill. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Bill Murphy, who also played uh, grammar school football and uh, high school football with Stafford, so he knew him quite well. Uh, Stafford Hood and I went to grade school at St. Leo. We played on a CYO championship team. We went on to play high school football at Leo High School. He played some college football at Whitewater, where he graduated and went on to get a doctorate degree. A great accomplishment from someone whose parents were from the south side of Chicago. Stafford was a great person, and he will be missed. God bless Stafford and his family. A good friend, Bill Murphy. Um, you want to take uh, Joe Power? This, uh, this, this next gentleman, his name is uh, Joseph Power, and um, uh, if any of you are in the legal field, you, you would certainly know Joe's name is uh, probably the most successful uh, personal injury attorney in the city of Chicago. He was another classmate and teammate of ours. So it starts down yeah. here. Mm -hmm. It says, Bob, sorry I can't be with you. I would suggest, here's his turn. Stafford was an extraordinary classmate, teammate, and leader. I was fortunate to have dinner with him and Bob Standring a few months before he passed, sharing many of our good memories from Leo. I am sorry I cannot be with you, but wish to extend my deepest sympathies to, the Stafford's, uh, to Stafford's wife, Denise, and his family on the loss of a truly wonderful human being, Joe Power. Um, let's see. Did you do uh, rattle it? Did yeah, you, we'll wrap it up. You think? Did, did you do Bob? Oh, I do Bob Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to give the <laughs> yeah. Tony's voice, <laughs> yeah. too. Um, th this is uh, another classmate of mine named uh, Bob Kelly, and his, his dad was actually a, a football coach uh, for Leo and um, actually uh, John, his actually name is Moose Gilmartin. We call him Moose is his name. And, and he used to imitate the coaches, and he got thrown off the bus one time for imitating this, this guy's dad, Tony Kelly. So I had to walk all the way home from the Dan Ryan's Woods on 87th back to Leo High School, what, 5.30, 6 o'clock at night in my football uniform. <laughs> for, for mocking the coach. Yeah. But, yeah. but Tony was a big, mean, nasty man, but he could coach. And his son, Bob, wrote this. Bob was in our class. Uh, his, uh, hey, Bob, sorry for the delay. He said, I do not have much to say other than that he was a terrific guy. I can recall my dad talking about Stafford's effort, and he had high regard for him. And to get that from Tony Kelly is pretty high praise, because Tony would go, Oh, uh, shit. You'll <laughs> never get there that way. <laughs> <laughs> Get off the bus, Moose. Get off the bus again. Yeah, you. Well, Stafford got there. <laughs> anyway, we're uh, just want to try to lighten it up a little bit. Um, all right, we're getting close here. Um, <clears throat> all right, I, I, had, I had just a few words. And uh, okay, where am I? Uh, we. Uh, Started, I first met Stafford back in the fall of 66, which is a long time ago, before some of you guys were born. Um, and um, uh, freshman classmates at Leo High School and also teammates. We shared a lot of laughter together over the years. Leo was a great school as it taught us the students to respect others no matter what ethnic background they came from. 
It provided the foundation <clears throat> for Stafford and I to remain friends for this long period of time. Leo High School taught, was taught by the Christian Brothers of Ireland. It, the makeup of Leo and the common bond was mainly parents who were blue collar, hardworking, policemen, firemen, city workers, union workers. The parents were trying to give their children a better life. Stafford was one of our class, classmates that took advantage of the opportunity by exceeding in class to whereas he received a PhD and became a college professor at the University of Illinois, which I'm an alumni and I'm gonna say this, is one of the best universities in the country. Um, when he came to teach at U of I, uh, we were able to rekindle our relationship. Um, I mentioned sharing laughs. We, um, we had catch some Illinois football games, and, and, but frankly, we'd always kind of revert back the conversation to when we were in high school and, and talk about some of the fun days we had when we were both playing. And um, it, it, it turned out that um, uh, back then for entertainment, as John mentioned earlier, going uh, to Leo High School, we did not have a, um, uh, our own football field, and we had to take a bus every day to practice about five miles away. And so here we had five months of uh, uh, hanging with other teammates in a sweaty bus for five months going back and forth. I mean, it was, it was it, so what we had to do was kind of create our own entertainment. And this is where Stafford would be in prime time. He, 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 he really did. So we would, um, so we actually decided on the bus ride, this five mile bus ride, we'd actually invent our own songs. So we actually came up with one that was actually pretty good. Um, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was a situation where we've all heard of Paul Revere. Paul Revere, you know, the midnight ride of Paul Revere, where he was the one that would come and warn us about the British are coming and all that kind of stuff. Well, on this bus ride, we developed this song called The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. And it goes something like this. And, and you, have to, you have to envision Stafford, 250 some odd pounds, uh, on the bus, you know, kind of jumping around and having a good time with this. <clears throat> song went like this. Say, listen, all you people, and you will hear about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. So running through the alleys and running through the streets yelling, Leo Lyons, this can't be beat. Walk with caution, step with fear. Leo Lyons all up in here. Say, ooh, ah, say, ooh, ah, say, ooh, ah, say, ooh, ah. And Stafford would be in the bus, and he'd be jamming around and stuff. And then, so so you, ask, you ask about our, our my favorite you know, visions of Stafford being this big guy up just having, living as large as life. He was enjoying life and really had a good day. Anyway, and it's a long time ago, but it still sticks out in my mind, so it was a lot of fun. But anyway, in, in closing, um, um, I just want to say I'm honored to say a couple words, and um, I wish you and your kids the best. Thanks a lot. Stafford. I hope you got a spot for us up there. <laughs> Thank you. There must have been something to the orange. My name is Cecil Lawrence, and uh, I went to St. Leo Grammar School with Stafford. Uh, when I tell people I went to St. Leo Grammar School, some of the younger people, they like, what kind of school is that? I say, you all probably refer to it as elementary school or grade school, but for us, it was St. Leo Grammar School. Uh, we had a very good time 
at St. Leo. Do we have any St. Leo's? Any of this fellow classmates in here? If we do, could you stand just for a hot second? No, I'm the only one. But that's okay. Uh, we had a lot of fun at St. Leo. We uh, created a little club there, which I almost got kicked out of. And Stafford was the one who was voting me out. <laughs> but he got overruled and we went on to become very good friends. Uh, at Leo High School, Stafford, uh, you've heard all the accolades about him at Leo. He's a great person, great leader. Uh, I, I remember our 50th reunion. We were all expecting Stafford to show, but he had another engagement and wasn't able to. But I know that uh, maybe a few weeks or so after that, he actually came and visited Leo High School, and I think he made a donation to the school uh, at that time. But we had good fun. Uh, I remember Stephanie and I had to go on a mission for the school, and we were using a school car. And Stephanie's a great person, but we took a little detour. And <laughs> Of course, <laughs> and of course, we got found out. Uh, the fortunate thing was we didn't get sent to the dean of discipline because that's somebody nobody ever wanted to see. That was Brother Linderman. Uh, but uh, they reported us to our parents, which was probably a little worse. Uh, we were comparing notes after that. I said, Stafford, man, my mother put me on punishment for a whole week. I can't watch TV. I can't do nothing. I got to stay in the house. He said, my dad punched me out. <laughs> I said, you got the worst of it, brother. I feel for you. But great friend. There are a lot, a lot of people that love Stafford Hood. A lot of people, you know, I could start naming them, but I wouldn't know where to stop. You know, everybody at Leo, everybody that went to St. Leo loved Stafford because he had that kind of personality. He was a great person. He was a great friend. I loved him very much. We had, a group of us had planned to come out to Arizona for spring training. But unfortunately, Stafford left us before we could do that. But we love Stafford. We feel great gratitude in having known him. And this is a celebration of life, so I'm going to say to the family, you have no regrets about Stafford Hood. He was the greatest. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> when Denise called and asked me would I say a few words about Stafford and us being in graduate school together. I said, yeah, okay, fine. I said, you know, I knew him more than grad. She said, just the graduate school part. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, that's fine. I can, I can manage that. So I'd like to first of all just say I am trying to represent all of us who were in graduate school with him. If you're here, would you just stand up for just a second so we can recognize a few of us that are here? Um, thank you. We were, we were all classmates in there with Stafford. <clears throat> and, you know, to know Stafford and, and to understand something, this, is, this was a convergence in, in the sense that we all ended up here together at one point in time but we never lost sight of each other in over 40 years. And some of us continued 
to talk to each other. And when technology caught up with our brains, <clears throat> we caught, talked to each other almost daily through texts, messages, and phone calls. That continued to happen until the day passed. Um, and to say, I met Stafford, Jim Anderson introduced me to Stafford the day I signed the papers to come down here to go to graduate school. I signed the papers, he says, okay, now you gotta go down and meet Stafford Hood. And I'm like, who is this? And is he a professor here? Or dean's? no, 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 he's a grad student. You're gonna do your grad assistantship down in the dean's office and you'll be working with Stafford Hood. So I went down and met Stafford, he introduced himself. Um, he talked for a moment about, you're gonna like it here on campus, there's some tenderloins, and then we kept going. And I'm like, tenderloins, okay. Uh, grocery stores are good down here. He's like, oh no, man, you know what I'm talking about. It, it, it. I'm saying, okay, fine. Man. Anyway, I came back about a month later to do my graduate assistant, and he and Guy Sinise, we're in the office together. The three of us were gonna be working with Terry Denny. And they said, before I step through the threshold, they says, okay, we got a couple questions for you. Now, Stafford's from the south side of Chicago, Guy's from the south side of Chicago, I'm from the south side of Chicago. And they says, which baseball team are you a fan of? And I stopped and looked, I'm like, what the heck? I said, well, I'm a White Sox fan. Okay, you can come on in. You, we, you can stay. I said, ooh, phew, good, I answered that question right. And then I got the presentation. You know, this university went out of its way to make room for you to hear. And this is no nonsense. We're here to get our degree, we're here to get work. It's about hard work and hard play. You got it? Hard work and hard play. I'm like, and I had just heard this lecture from Jim. Parker and I had just gotten our orientation from Jim. You come here, you work hard, you play hard. I'm like, got it. Now, I didn't realize at that particular point what hard play was. <laughs> I had a sense of hard work. There was the work that was expected by our professors, but then Stafford put another layer on that. He says, you know, we got to talk about what you're interested in. And he would challenge myself and all of us as grad students what we were doing all the time. And especially the brothers that were here, Stafford would just say, we got to talk about the work. And is it serious? Are you here or are you just around? No nonsense. We don't have time for nonsense here. And that was how we started. And we started critiquing each other's work. We were patterning ourselves over the professors that we saw. Now, we were, as Jim will say, we were probably harder on ourselves than they were on us. But remember, Stafford kind of had this, I'm a halfback. I'm going through that line. You better be able to get your work done. He ran us into that thing. And so we carried that work on even past graduate school. Even today, we do it the hard play. That was another level. It was about music, good food, baseball, bid whist, in no particular order as long as we checked all the boxes off. And we did that. And that was a part of what we had to do. Stafford also would keep track of all the students on campus to make, minority students on campus, to make sure they were getting their needs met. And he was like a precinct captain. You know, in Chicago, in the politics, you got pre Stafford was the precinct captain for the University of Illinois black and brown graduate students. And if anybody ran into trouble, he'd run back and tell Jim or Terry or somebody, hey, Mildred, somebody, you, you, you gotta help such and such, they, they having a problem. Th that's what he did, and I realized, I said, oh, this dude's the precinct captain for the place. Now, he would get people to do things, and they didn't know what they were doing. Jim says, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna get Jim to go do this. He was the one that convinced Jim, our second year here, he needed to teach a class on the history of blacks in higher education in the United States. And he got us together, he, Jim was like, I, and he said, no, you gotta teach us the class. We, he taught us the class, and I think that led to a book that you wrote from, from that class. He also decided that the black 
that there was no organization on campus. The Black Graduate Student Association had been defunct for a while, and he says, we got to resurrect that. So he helped to resurrect that organization on campus, which today is still here and I believe still thriving. So you can see some of the things that he would inspire to do. Now, there are two things to understand about Stafford as a graduate student. There was Stafford, the graduate student, before he met Denise. <laughs> and there was Stafford, the graduate student, after he met Denise. So I'm going to take just a few more minutes before Denise and then after Denise, and I got to come back. As Jim said, to get to know Stafford is to know Stafford's family. You got to know his mom and his dad, as he said, Virginia and Pops. And you got to know them and his dog, Sule. We'll get to Sule in a second. <laughs> and going to the house or going up to the fort, they had a summer home up in Fort Atkinson, right next to Whitewater, and to go up there and to fish. Now, fishing for Stafford was a religion, but understand, you, everyone's got an image of Stafford standing on the river with the pole. The real vision, reality was there was a park bench they got from Chicago they put by the river. They put their poles up on the, on, on the bench and hook them up there and put the line in, and they go back into the house and eat and drink. And they look to see which pole was wigging, and they go back down and then pull a the fish. That was, that was fishing, OK? And I caught going over to the house, sitting on the porch, when we did not go to one of his spots where his family lived. We would just spend some time on his porch. As time went by, I caught Stafford calling Pops Shorty. And so that was an interesting dynamic. I never called Pops Shorty. I called him, you know. Pops, and that, that, that was cool. Sule. Stafford loved dogs. I loved dogs. And one of our things was to understand our love for dogs. But Sule didn't like anyone but Stafford. That was obvious. That was it. The only other person first that Sule allowed to, you know, he tolerate was Brian Miller. And Brian introduced me to Jim. Brian and I had been friends 10 years, and that's how I got to know Jim. And Brian and Sule got along, and Stafford was able to leave Sule with Brian whenever he went out of town, when he was in graduate school. Then Denise showed up. Now, there is other theories about how Denise and Stafford met. Uh, but all those theories be aside, they met. And I remember getting the call that said, you know, Chapman, I met this young Delta. She just got on campus. Interesting. I said, interesting. OK, fine. And then the next thing I know, he stopped by the house, said, Can, I need a drink. I gave him a drink. And he says, you know, I, I, I've been talking to this little young sister that's in here. This, it's interesting. It <laughs> might be all right. And I said, has she met Sule yet? <laughs> he says, well, that's the reason I had to come by and get a drink. I said, well, what happened? He says, well, Sule likes her. In fact, Sule is paying more attention to her. He pays attention to me. And I said, and I called Parker. I said, Parker, we got something happening here. <laughs> Sule has gone over on the other side, and you know it's just a matter of time before Stafford continues to, to do that. The beauty of it is it worked after all these years. Now, I think that Stafford carried on these things that he developed here as a graduate student, and you've heard about all the work he's done and all the accomplishments he's done. And to try and to push this into just a few minutes, I'm just trying to represent another aspect. And I want to, two things. One, just acknowledge the Lodge, because he created this friendship that we all stayed together. We all would, once a month, go over to the Union in those days and have the chowder, then go across the street to Deluxe and have fish sandwiches, and then have our sessions. And we would do that. 
But I want to go back to my first weeks here as the lodge began to sort of mold. Stafford got an invitation. He and Jesse Hargrove got invitations to Halloween parties, costume parties. And he says, Chapman, we need to go to these. They, they really do Halloween down here differently. I said, OK. He says, we got to have a costume. I said, I ain't got no money for a costume. He says, you, you figure out something. So I put together this army fatigues I had. And if you remember the movie Apocalypse, the gunner on the boat did the psychedelic um, camouflage plane. I did that. I said, what are you coming at, Hood? He says, you know the Isaac Hayes album with Black Moses? He says, I'm, I'm coming with Black Moses. And he had this maroon robe. He came over, he brought some grease paint, white grease paint, I put it on his face. And we went to pick up Jesse Hargrove. Jesse came to the door in a maroon and white, double knit walking suit, bell bottoms, with a maroon fur collar and a brim. And he introduced himself as Imp the Skimp, the Halloween pimp. And we proceeded to go and jump around to different Halloween parties. The one party was, we were invited to was uh, one of the professors or administrators in psychology. And he came to the door. And we thought, people were looking at us all night like, oh my gosh, look at this group. We thought, well, no one's going to outdo us until we went to the last one. And they came to the door with his beard in a light blue powder tutu <laughs> with high heels, looked at us, we looked at him, he says, oh, we're going to have fun in here tonight, and that was it. So that gives you a sense of the parameter of the playfulness, but the seriousness of the work. Work hard and play hard became the model that we all live by. We continue that model into today. And so I appreciate the opportunity to come up here and just share a few of the thoughts, uh, a few of the moments, and thank all of you for coming. Thank you. You talk about some hard acts to follow. I don't have any of them stories. I, I, I you know, um, First of all, let me just say on behalf of my family, um, we love you, Denise, and you know that. Um, Big Brother Stafford Hood, scholar, brother, friend, bridge builder. Wow. Um, I'm just listening to those stories and I go, wow. By the time I met Stafford in the 90s, he was telling me about Whitewater and the, and the fishing. He was telling me about Leo. I got to experience a little bit of sessions with him, but not in the way that I've heard of um, just, this, just today. There's so much to say about Stafford and there's not, a, there's not enough, enough time, there ain't enough liquor, <laughs> food, popcorn, um, and those lovely things that he used to like. There's not enough of it. And so I'm certainly indebted in, in, in the influence that he paid in my life, um, not just as scholar, friend, brother, but definitely as man and big brother. He, um, so I brought a couple poems. I'm the one standing between here and, 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 and the feast. And so I just want to make sure um, I say a few things just to let you know how much he meant to me as well. And I'm on, I'm on much of his, of the sort of mid-career trajectory, not a scholar, maybe a scholar, but also particularly as men uh, to, to our relationship, our friendship, our conversations, our writings, our archive. I will never forget, ever forget the 2011 centennial in Washington, D.C. on the account of our 100th anniversary. And it was fun, believe it. And there's more stories to talk about that that I'm not going to get into. But just the manner by which the scholar was able to work hard, play hard, Chapman and Jay, you know, because you showed up in Howard's Founders Library those couple days before Founders before the before the uh, centennial, 
for us to do work. And so just remembering that, that man and, and, and what he stood for. Uh, you've heard the legacy of Korea and what an amazing event last week it was with the turnout. He would have been exceedingly happy. Well, he, he, he had a way of um, being happy with a lot of folk and then in the set with a couple of us, he would tell us some other things like, you know, I thought we, we don't need to go above 350 people. So he would not have been happy with 470 people registered, that I know. But we know that he would have, he would have been okay enough with it. Um, he might not have been okay with the donations that we received about over 100,000 because we, had, had, we didn't have much time, but I think he would have been okay with it in the end. And so just, um, just knowing that he, we worked real hard to make sure that this was a, a Korea that would be lasting forever and that the legacy that he stood for, the AEA preps, the AERA sessions, there was always another draft to go over. Uh, there's a, for those of you who go to AERA, there's a, there's a table in his name at the, at the round table um, advancing black education take table that's been going on for 26 years is a table in his honor. And so he's left many things behind us. The two poems I brought, uh, one that I, I definitely think epitomizes him because of the way he also stood in my life. Uh, an old man going on a long highway came out of the evening, looked cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide, through which was falling a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim, the sullen stream, had no fear for him, and he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Oh man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with an ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path I have come, he said, there followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been as naught to me, to that fair haired youth, May a pitfall be. May a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him. So that brush stood, he's, for me, he was the ultimate bridge builder. You heard the stories from his classmates. You heard the story from his thesis advisor, his, 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 his um, peers, bridge builder. And the last one was Life by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And then Denise. Um, a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in, a minute to smile and an hour to weep in, a pint of joy to a peck of trouble and never a laugh, but the moans come double, and that is life. A crust in a corner that love makes precious with a smile to warm and the tears to refresh us, and joy seems sweeter when cares come after, and a moan is the finest of foils for laughter, and that is life. Again, thank you, Denise, for sharing the big brother, and um, you're coming up for the last bit. We love you. Well, good evening. To conclude our remarks, thank you. I appreciate everyone coming, for being here, for sharing this time with us, and for um, loving and supporting and working with Stafford for for so long. Uh, please enjoy the refreshments uh, until it's time for us to go. Thank you.